Good afternoon. How's everybody doing? I am so excited to be here today. Um, and it is so wonderful to see so many of your bright and smiling faces this afternoon. Um, and uh, I am, as, as you've heard, I am an attorney and I work south of the border in New Orleans, Louisiana, in the United States. And so let me just address it now. No, I do not have alligators in my backyard. No, I do not live in a swamp. And no, I do not go fish for my dinner every night. And this is actually my first time in Canada. And from what I understand, this is one of the first events in a while, right? So I am very humbled and excited to be here and join you today. And many of you may be wondering, why exactly am I here? And why I'm here today is really to share with you a story. Melissa and Brian, they lived in Columbus, Indiana. They were 18 years old. They were seniors in high school. They weren't married. And they didn't have any money saved. And Melissa was pregnant. So they easily decided that the best and simplest solution for them was to get an abortion. So they decided to drive to the abortion clinic in Indianapolis. But to get into the abortion clinic that morning, they had to pass the usual pro-life protesters that were praying for them on the sidewalk, that were talking to them on the sidewalk, and they were trying to get them to change their minds. And one woman from the sidewalk told Melissa, that her baby has 10 fingers and 10 toes. And Melissa heard these words and still proceeded inside the clinic. Melissa actually sat on the abortion doctor's table ready to abort her child. When she thought back to what the lady outside the clinic had told her, that her baby had 10 fingers and 10 toes. And she felt a calling that her baby was real, that her baby was special, and that her baby was meant for someone special. So she decided to leave the abortion clinic and choose adoption. And that's how I'm here today. I was that baby 28 years ago. And it, it may surprise you that I once was a very shy individual. I never thought I would ever be public speaking or sharing our story because for a long time, I didn't want anybody to know that I was adopted. I, looking back, it's, it's crazy that I once felt like that, but like every high school kid wants to feel, I just wanted to fit in. And growing up, I just had so many different experiences with individuals who found out that I was adopted. And I'll never, I'll never forget this. I was on the playgrounds. I was in my early years at aftercare and uh, someone had found out that I was adopted. And news just spread like wildfire. This was the talk of the town. And people loved sharing the fact that I was adopted. I surely didn't. And one girl, I'll never forget it, found out and in front of everybody, in front of everybody, said, so you're an orphan. And I'll never forget that. It wasn't the fact that she called me an orphan that bothered me. It was the fact that that's what she thought my adoption was. She didn't understand adoption. And that's what had bothered me so much. And growing up, those are, the, those are the common statements and questions that, that I would get. And so I did my best to always hide the fact that I was adopted while in our house always celebrated. We celebrated Adoption Day every year. It was like a second birthday for me. Um, and so it was the best thing ever. And my grandparents would get happy birthday cards and they'd, they'd scratch out the birthday and they'd put adoption. So we very much were open, we very much celebrated adoption, but not at school and not with my peers. 
And I always knew that my birth mother was originally in an abortion clinic and never really understood what that meant. I never really understood that decision. And throughout the early years before I went into high school, I would, I would periodically wonder, you know, who, who is she? Who is my birth father? But there were never persistent thoughts. There were never everyday questions. It was just something that was in my mind. But I really didn't want to think about it too much because I didn't want to be different. I just wanted to fit in. And I joined, well, I, when I went to a Jesuit high school in New Orleans, Louisiana, um, I went there as an eighth grader and still not really sure in the fact that I was adopted. And I was trying to, to find where I fit in. And my mom suggested the pro-life club. And I know why she suggested it. And I decided just to, just to give it a try. And so I went to, went to their first meeting and really found where I fit in. And I started to learn about these issues, these issues that y'all are here to, uh, to fight for. And so uh, as I'm learning about it, I'm really starting to realize the significance of my birth mother and birth father for their courageous decision to choose life, to choose adoption, because without that decision, I wouldn't be here today. And y'all would have needed another speaker. And so as I'm learning about these issues and adoption and abortion, I'm still not really openly sharing the fact that I'm adopted. And you wouldn't believe what it took for me to finally embrace my story. You, you, you really won't believe it. You won't see where this is going. Um, so I joined the wrestling team as well. I wanted to be a WWE wrestler, and that didn't work out for me. Uh, but as I'm wrestling, I'm starting to get all of these headaches. And these headaches get increasingly worse. And ultimately, I had brain surgery um, in the summer after my eighth grade year to relieve the headaches, to relieve this pressure that I had. And so when I recovered and came back to school, uh, maybe some of you can relate to this, um, you really want to just fit in. And I wasn't because I was coming back to school. I had this big brain surgery scar on the back of my head. And I really didn't fit in. I was getting a lot of questions. And it got to a point where I just really felt a calling to embrace who I was. And I really attribute, it, attribute that to this experience with the brain surgery and feeling different externally. And so I, I decided to tell it. I heard of the Louisiana Right to Life pro-life oratory contest where they gave a cash prize and you could tell a pro-life story and, and maybe you'd get a cash prize in the end. And uh, I was like, you know, I, I feel a calling to do this. And so I, I joined the contest and at that point, all of the story, all the story was was the fact that my birth parents were in an abortion clinic. They left and chose adoption. So I tell the story for the first time, something I never thought I would ever do. And I'm so glad that God called me to do that because my life has changed tremendously since sharing that story and embracing the fact that I was adopted. And after I shared it for the first time, exactly one month later, we got a call from the law firm that facilitated my adoption saying that my birth mother was interested in an update. We had had no communication at all. I didn't know who she was. I didn't know how to get in touch with her. And I didn't want to get in touch with her. I have my mom and dad. I have my life. I have my grandparents. And that's all I needed at that point in my life. So other than these random thoughts, meeting her certainly never crossed my mind. And my family, my family was very excited when we got the call. They were more excited than I was. And we prayed about it for a long time and realized that, that we did want to have 
this communication. We wanted to see who she was and to say thank you. Because but for my birth mother's courageous decision to choose adoption, I wouldn't be here today. So we decided to send a letter. And in my letter, I, uh, I asked her if she had Facebook. And if she felt compelled, she could add me on Facebook and we could have a, a little Facebook relationship. And uh, I guess in my mind, you know, I, I guess I really didn't think she'd do it. And two weeks later, I remember getting a, a firm request from her and opening it up and, and, and just feeling in shock. Like, wow, this is my birth mother who was in an abortion clinic, left and chose adoption, and here she is messaging me on Facebook after 18 years. It's a big deal. And so uh, I just remember going home and talking to my parents and trying to find the words to say. Because it's a very... Um, uncommon situation to be in and really had no idea what I would tell her. And I drafted up a message and my parents looked at it and, and uh, it was really a thank you message. And it was exactly what I've said numerous times today, thank you for your decision. And we started having dialogue, we started messaging each other on Facebook a lot and I realized that I had a full-blood biological sister to whom I was a big brother to, and I had no idea. And I, I had grown up an only child, so to find that out was, it was incredible. And I was soon in touch with my birth father as well. And we started talking on Facebook, and I realized that I also had a half-sister to whom I was a big brother to. So to find out all of these things exactly one month after I, I shared our story for the first time, was, it was incredible. And so as the story is evolving, and it's, it's still evolving, as, as I'll share with you later, um, I'm still sharing the story. I'm sharing it with Louisiana Right to Life at some local events around New Orleans. And so I have this relationship with them where they ask me to come speak, I share the story, and so they're, they're following us, they're following our journey. And eventually, Melissa, my birth mother messages about meeting. And I was not, I was not ready to meet right away at all. Uh, I really wanted to get to know her a little more, and I, just wasn't, I wasn't ready yet. But eventually, I was ready. And my, my family and I became very, very excited to be able to meet, meet her and meet my birth father, Brian, and Louisiana Rights to Life had heard about our plans to meet. And the executive director of that organization called me and said, David, we really have an opportunity here to impact people on the adoption option. And so I, I remember him saying this. I was like, where is this going? And he asked me, very directly if I'd feel comfortable with a film team coming to film our first time meeting. I wasn't very thrilled by the idea. I was very shy. I still am shy. After I speak, I, you know, I gotta go home and just kinda decompress. Uh, so I was shy, I wasn't still ready for that and didn't know whether this personal moment whether, we, whether it should be filmed. It felt like it would be a very intimate moment. I didn't know what it'd feel like. But I prayed about it for a while, and my parents prayed about it for a while, and realized we really did have a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to show a real-life meeting like this, a real-life thank you. Because for every 145 abortions in the United States, there's only two adoption referrals. That's a crazy number. And to be honest, I'm not familiar with Canada statistics, but I suspect it's the ratio is a little more different as well, right? And when you look at those numbers and realize how few adoptions there are, and when you look at 
the adoption stigmas that I've experienced, some of which I've shared with you today. You know, people still think, and this is not just, this is adults as well, when, you know, when I started that, telling people that we were planning on meeting my birth parents, their questions were, are you sure you're ready to meet your mom? Are you sure you're ready to meet your dad? And my response to them was always the same. Who I'm about to meet is not my mom, it's not my dad. It is my birth father and it is my birth mother. And there is a big difference between those relationships. And growing up, uh, I just dealt with the consistent questions on adoption and, and there was this stigma that an adopted child is somehow lesser of a child. And so when you took those stigmas and when you take those statistics on how many or how few adoptions there really are, really fueled our desire to reclaim the beauty of adoption. We wanted to, because we hoped that maybe showing our reunion and showing our thank you meeting could impact even one other person. We didn't know what we were going to do with it. We were just going to film it, put it online, and hope, that, uh, hope, hope somebody sees it. And God's, God took this story and has elevated it into ways we, we, we never would have imagined. So when we said yes to having it filmed, we, of course, had to get my birth parents' agreement on that as well, because you can't just show up and, and have it filmed. And I, to be honest, having it filmed was, it actually made it, I think, a little less awkward, because we had something to bond over about how awkward it was that these cameras were following us. So there's a real life, and it was mentioned earlier in the introduction, there's a real life documentary out there called I Lived on Parker Avenue. I've spoken to some of you today. I know at least some of you have seen it, but if you haven't seen it, I I would really hope you go home and watch it today because it shows my family and I meeting my birth family for the first time. And I won't give away the the title. I'm, I, 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 the title is very intriguing and people ask questions about it. But I want you to go home and you watch it and then I suspect at the end of the documentary you may get the title. And it's online, it's, it's online at ilivedonparkerab.com. It's on YouTube as well. So we drove up there. Actually, I took the train up there to Indiana and my parents drove. And the feeling of driving up to my birth mother's house after 18 years. It's very hard to put into words what it's like. That's the most common question. And I wanted to say, go see the documentary. But uh, it's, I was so, you'll, you'll, you'll see in the documentary, I was very awkward. I was very uncomfortable. Uh, I did, really didn't know what to expect. I kind of knew her kind of knew a little bit about her through all the Facebook conversations we had had, but really didn't know her. I didn't know what I was getting myself into. In the back of my mind, I worried, was this really, is this really right for us to be doing? I knew it was, but I was just scared, which I think was a normal reaction. So we drove up and, and, and we had a hug and it was extremely emotional. And I remember seeing my, my birth sister as well standing, you know, by the house and gave her a hug too and just started connecting. And it was, it was amazing. And the first question that my birth mother had for me was whether I hated her. And I couldn't believe the question because I never once hated her for her decision. Her decision to choose adoption was a loving, brave decision that ultimately gave me life. And so to be able to see her in person and say thank you and say, no, I don't hate you at all. I love you for your decision was very healing for her. And it was the same way for my birth father as well. He had struggled with it. There was a feeling that they gave me up, which is another common misconception about adoption. And to see them and meet them gave them the comfort and healing that they needed 
to realize that their decision was not a wrong decision. Their decision was a loving decision. Their decision was a brave decision. So I think we have a, we have a trailer as well, which I'd love to share with you guys. It's a trailer on the documentary, and it, I think it has some really good scenes in it. So if y'all are ready back there, I'm ready up here. Tomorrow, I'm gonna hop on a train and I will meet my birth parents for the first time. This has been 19 years in the making and I'm extremely nervous. I wanna see what he looks like in person, his voice, his smile, my hug, I've been waiting. Kinda wondered, you know, does he hate us? You know, I think it's caused a lot of depression from time to time. The reality is David was seconds, literally, for not being here. It's kind of a bittersweet because I wanted him. We're gonna all fill in this missing piece of the puzzle that has been in all three of our lives. It's gonna be an overwhelming experience. I'm nervous, but I'm really excited. ever knowing what might have been. So that's a little teaser into what our documentary looks like online. And going back to kind of our goals with it, we really wanted to just put it out there and see what would happen. And this documentary has changed our family's lives so much. We followed God's calling with this, and he has used this story in ways we never would have imagined. We were able to tour this documentary across the country in schools, high schools, churches, right to life banquets, and we were able to get on news outlets to share it and this has impacted people, in, again, in ways we never would have imagined. And I'm, I continue to hear stories about how this film has, has impacted people just this afternoon. And it helped someone with their decision to meet their birth family as well. And I'll never forget, I was in a high school in California. And it was a gym. It was a, it was a big, it was a big gym. And both the student, you know, students were on both sides of it. And I was in the middle. And we did a Q&A, kind of like what I think we'll do after I'm done today. And people were asking questions. And I, I'll just never forget this one girl that, was, that I saw, and she stuck out to me. She was in the corner. I could tell that this film, the full documentary, had impacted her in a, in a certain way. I didn't know how but it impacted her. And I kept seeing her hand start to raise up and go back down, raise up, go back down. That's what happened like five times. You knew she wanted to say something and she was getting the courage to say it. Finally, she stood up. I'll never forget this. I wish it was recorded. She stands up and shares for the first time in front of her entire school that she was adopted and that this is something she didn't feel comfortable with, something that she wanted to hide, much like myself. And this film, this resource, gave her the courage and the confidence to share that. And every single student in the gym stood up and started clapping. It was incredible. And there's been so many stories like that. And through all of these talks and all of these events where we can share the documentary, we've met a lot of people. And we've heard a lot of stories. And I'm, I'm most proud, we're most proud of the fact that we've learned that at least 20 women have chosen adoption because they saw this documentary. 
And that, even just one, would have made this, all of this work, all of these efforts worth it. But 20, it was incredible. And I actually had the honor of meeting one of them in Louisiana. So that's the power of this story, and that's the power of this documentary. And once it was online, we kind of wondered what was next. We'd always joked about this being a movie. We never actually thought it would be a movie. And Louisiana Rights to Life and I just continued to joke about it and wonder, you know, maybe that was what's next. But but we certainly didn't have the connections to do that. We don't know anything about movies. And I was driving home from law school, and I, I remember this distinctly. I was driving home, going back to my apartment, and I got a call. It was a California number. And I didn't know who it was. I answered the phone. And it says, hey, David. And I say, hello. Who's this? And he said, it's Kirk Cameron. And I said, oh, hey. How are you? And for those of you who don't know Kirk Cameron, he was a big star in the 80s. He had a show, Growing Pains, and his sister was DJ on Full House. And he was a big deal, and he's he's been so wonderful at sharing God's message and he's just a wonderful individual. And I never thought he would call me, yet alone call me about this reason. He called me and said, David, I saw your documentary. This has to be a full length movie. And I remember just hearing him say that and me just kind of sitting in the car like, sure. I would love that. And as, you, as you're aware now, because we've talked about Life Mark already, uh, it has been turned into a movie. And it's, it's, it's incredible to see God continuing to work through this story in ways we never would have imagined. The movie is called Life Mark. It releases this fall. And I hope that you'll go see it in theaters. I believe they're still working on distribution in Canada as to where it'll be, et cetera. But we were able to go on set. We were able to to see some of the scenes being filmed. And one of my favorite scenes that we got to witness was a scene where, and it's crazy to talk about, right? The scene where we drove up to my birth mother's house. So we saw them actually play that scene. And it it was just incredible to see it now you know, having lived it, having lived those emotions, to seeing it now through the documentary form and seeing it impact so many people, so many people we never thought we would have reached, and to now see it being propelled to broader audiences that we certainly couldn't have reached. So it is so promising to see right now how the story is being used. I hope that you'll go, and there's no social media yet for Life Mark, but it's coming soon. So hope you'll go follow I Live in Parker Avenue on social media because I guarantee you we'll be talking about Life Mark coming up soon. And uh, one of the, you'll, you'll see it, there's a special scene in there where my birth mother and I are actually in a scene together. We don't have any lines at all, but it was just really symbolic for us both to be there. And like, like she had said earlier in my introduction, you know, I, I'm now a lawyer in New Orleans I love to do this when I can. It's getting increasingly difficult to speak and travel, but I love it. And it's so rewarding to be able to be here, to share our story and to meet so many of you and to hear so many other adoption stories, two of which I heard today. Stories that are not that dissimilar from ours. And before I conclude, I would like to briefly mention the topic of the day. I suspect it's the topic of a few decades, Roe versus Wade. Have you all heard of that? There are some promising things happening in the United States right now. I don't wanna, I don't wanna jinx it. My wife always knocks on wood when we say something you don't wanna jinx. But I'll, I'll always remember walking, you know, I went to the, the March for Life as an eighth grader. That was the first time I went there. 
And I went there every year in high school, every year in college. And to be there and see so many pro-life people that are there for the same reason you're there, it was just incredible. And to see now the Supreme Court, and again, don't want to jinx it, but this leaked opinion is a big deal and it is so exciting in the states right now, so exciting in all these right to life groups in every single state that I suspect adoption, if it ever was an important issue, it is now. I suspect adoption will be talked about more than ever and it needs to be because adoption is a loving option. Adoption is a loving choice and adoption saves lives and builds families. That's how I'm here today. But for adoption, my parents wouldn't have the gift of their only child and my grandparents wouldn't have the gift of their only grandchild. And if, that, if there's any message you remember from me today, I hope it's that. That one woman's brave, courageous decision allowed me to live, allowed my family to have a family. And but for that one pro-life protester, not sure where I'd be today. And that's the power of the pro-life movement. That's the power of the pro-life cause. I was seconds away from being just another number, from being just another statistic on how many abortions occurred in the United States each day. So thank you for your presence. Thank you for your pro-life work and your pro-life efforts because it saves lives. I am living testimony to that fact. So thank you so much for being here today, for having me, for listening to me. I hope I wasn't too boring. And I hope that you'll go home and, and watch I Live in Parker Avenue. And feel free to ask me questions. Like reach out to me, for real. I'll answer any questions you have. And I hope that you'll also go watch Life Mark when it releases in the fall. And for those of you who will be there tomorrow at the March for Life, I will see you tomorrow. And I look forward to standing for life with you guys. Thank you. Oh, yeah, yeah. Thanks, David, for your compelling testimony. Um, so we now have 10 minutes to answer some questions. So Josie and I will be standing at this aisle and this aisle with a microphone. So if you have a question, please just come up to the front and hopefully we'll be able to answer them all in the next 10 minutes or so. Anybody? I know you're all probably shy like David, but it's okay. It's no different than if you're just to raise your hand, except this time you have to come to the mic. <laughs> I'm okay. It's okay to ask questions. Nobody has any questions at all. They, oh, thank you over there. And I know you guys have questions. I know it's just that you're nervous and you don't want to be the one person who gets up there. Oh, yeah, please, please come. <laughs> A round of applause for this brave individual. Hi. I was there at uh, the, the, the event, the premiere yesterday. I, I really appreciated the movie, everything. Um, I, I, have, I was wondering about the various achievements uh, that you list or show in the movie. Um, you know, uh, like how well did you do in terms of, say, the wrestling or um, the competition, the speech competition, as well as the skydiving and the other activities. Uh, you know, so, so what type of awards did you win? And also, like, how, how much did you enjoy those various activities? Yeah, thanks for asking that. So the movie did a really, I don't want to give too much away about the movie, but the movie did a really good job at being a true story. It says it's inspired by a true story, and I can tell you now, it really is inspired by a true story. 
The way they paralleled my real life events, the way the Kendrick brothers called me almost every day to clarify what actually happened was, it really made the process really special. And there are a lot, you'll see it's very similar to the documentary, but obviously it's a movie. It needs to have a little, little something, something, right, to make it a little more dramatic, a little funnier, because I can tell you now, the documentary is not very funny. Uh, there are some funny moments, but it's not really a comedy. And uh, they have me in there as a, as a, a big wrestler. And I can, I, I can tell you now, I was not a championship wrestler at all. I was terrible. I thought I was gonna get in there, you get the WWE steel chair, you just, you know, you have that kind of wrestling, and it wasn't like that. And uh, so, but it's true because that's what I was doing as I realized what was going on with my headaches. And the more I was wrestling, the more frequent it got, the worse it got. And eventually I was told I couldn't do that anymore. And I, I physically couldn't anyway because the headaches were so bad. So that's true. And I'm trying to think what else, anything else that you're, came to mind? The, the pro-life speech as yeah. well as the skydiving and you know, yeah. those various... Uh... So the skydiving actually happened. And you'll see it in the documentary. Uh, I, I, we, you know, we arrived to Indiana, we met my birth mother, and she literally asked me if I would go skydiving with her. I swear, you'll see it in the documentary. And I, I'd never gone. I, I was like, I, I guess, if you're asking me, you put me on the spot. And so we went, and it was filmed, so both of us jumped out of the plane for no reason and made it safely to the ground, thankfully. So the skydiving was real. The pro-life oratory contest was real. I joined the pro-life oratory contest in eighth grade. That's the speech that I was talking about earlier. And... Uh, did not win. I know, I know. Came in second. And the next year I did it again and ended up, I won that one and, and did the state contest and then went to the national contest. Didn't win that one. I got real nervous and sweaty and uh, just kind of flaked or fluked, whatever the word is, and I uh, didn't win the national one. Uh, so the pro life oratory contest is, is it's, that was real. And that's what I really love about this movie, is that it's so true. And it just shows, I mean, this is a story that, it, it, Kirk says it frequently, it's better than any story they could have scripted. And I, I truly believe that. It's such a powerful story, not only from my end, but from the adoptive parents' end, the birth parents' end. And it shows the realities of adoption, it shows the positive aspects of it, and it shows the negatives of it, because my adoption wasn't a perfect fairy tale ending. You see very visibly that my birth mother really grasped and struggled with her decision for, for nearly two decades. And so I'm really excited that this film, let me clarify, the documentary, I guess, and the movie, uh, uh, how it'll shed light on this issue and option. Because uh, again, I think it's going to be more important than ever to be talking about it. And I hope that this, this will be a resource, and the movie will be a resource as well to talk about these issues. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Hi there. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, so feel free to let me know if this question is out of bounds. I figured you might have gotten something like this before. But uh, uh, a while back, I was actually in a relationship with someone who was pro-choice. I know, fantastic decision, right? Um, that worked out, but uh, um, no, no offense to them, no nothing like that, but this was someone who actually went through a lot, and a lot of what you were talking about kind of made me think of her, you know? Um, she had a parent who, f it's way more, in I don't want to say it like that, but uh, she had a parent that um, uh, flat out didn't want her, and uh, she suffered from uh, physical ailments just like you did, um, and she had gone through a lot in her life, and I had a lot of respect for her for that and everything, but... Um, when this topic came up, one thing that kind of I just didn't have any answer for, I had no way of, uh, 
of reconciling, because it's not my place to reconcile, but at least to support what I was incapable of, was when she flat out told me that, oh, if my mother had aborted me, I would have been okay with that. And so wondering with your specific background, with what went with you, and do let me know if the question is out of bounds, um, how would you respond to that? Not necessarily as somebody trying to save anyone, but just somebody trying to support and trying to just give a helping hand when they're asked to. Yeah. Uh, the question is not out of bounds. I'm, I'm an open book, uh, so feel free to ask whatever. Um, I guess I'm a, I, I need a little clarification on that. 100%. Uh, what, what, what do you uh, like uh, clarification how? Like how, in terms of how to talk about adoption or on that? Oh, or? Yeah, it's more like, uh, like that's something that I've, I've come to hear not only from this individual, from other people who go, if I was never born, I don't really have a problem with that. And yeah. so, you know, it's like hearing that from somebody talking about themselves, I'm like, holy moly, like, you know what I mean? Yeah. And so I guess, does that provide enough clarification? Yeah. Or? Um, I've actually never gotten that question before. That's that's a that's a new one. Um, I mean, I look. I I'm glad that I'm here. And even though I kind of struggled with with the adoption decision, I never once had any resentment for my birth mother, or for my birth father. And I'm just glad that I'm here today because of her decision. In regard to the statement as to, you know, I wouldn't have cared if my birth mother had chosen abortion, I, I would, because I like my life, you know? <laughs> and uh, so, I, I mean, I guess I, I don't, that's a, it's not really a, a, a kind of an open dialogue kind of question there. So I'm not really sure how I would have responded to that. Um, but I would say that I've also gone through um, my life struggling with, with those kind of issues as well. And even though I was struggling with those issues, I'm just very thankful. And I know that she could have made a much, some would say easier decision, but I don't think it would have been an easier decision. Uh, you see all kinds of stories about birth mothers, you know, having very, very like, difficult, very strong emotions after they have an abortion. And so I'm just very thankful for her as how I would have responded to that, I think. Does that, does that help? Yeah, no, fair enough. Sorry okay. for putting you on the spot, That's but thank right. you. Hi. <laughs> um, sorry. Um, kind of crazy, because um, I've never actually met someone with a story as similar as mine. 17 years ago, my birth parents decided to adopt instead of, like, give up for adoption instead of abort as well. Um, so... I'm thankful for that. I do want to meet my birth parents eventually. How do I, like... Oh, sorry. Tell my parents that I want to meet them. Wow. Thank you for, for sharing that. Um, so I don't know... I'm, I'm not familiar with, with how adoption works in Canada. Um... Mine was governed by Indiana law, which uh, allowed contact if the parties both wanted it after I was 17. And my family had very much celebrated adoption. Uh, it was celebrated every year. And so they were very proud of my adoption. They wanted to tell people more than I would. And I'll tell you this, when we first were planning a meeting, they were much more excited than I was about it. But I still felt weird. I still felt like I wanted them to know that even though I'm now meeting my birth mother, they're my parents. And I, I knew they knew that, but it was important for me to tell them that. And it's like, it was uncomfortable. And I found the, the best way to do it, and for me, individually, I'm more of a writer. And you'll see in the documentary, I actually, it was all film, I actually wrote them letters. 
the night before we left for me to go meet my birth parents. And the letters, I, I don't remember exactly what was in there, but the general synopsis of it was that, look, I, I feel it makes me sad that you're not my birth parents. Like, that bothers me sometimes because I love y'all so much. And when I wrote that in a letter form and gave it to him, it was just, it was, it was incredibly touching. And I think it gave them a little bit of confirmation that, even though they already had it, that look, I'm not going to replace them. And I'm not trying to replace them, and that's not my intention. And I'm not gonna be going to Indiana every month. I'm not gonna be going there every Christmas and, and Thanksgiving. But just to, just to meet them and say thank you, and to have that relationship now through text and, and Facebook every now and then. And they were okay with that. They were, as I said, more excited than I was. And I found being, it was tough, but being open with them and, and, and just reaffirming them that they're my parents, that was the best way for, that, I, that I found to handle it. My birth dad, actually, before I was born, he wrote me a letter to read when I was 16, which my mom gave to me. Um, it basically just apologized for that, you know, things happen, and he was just, he was basically saying that he's grateful that I have a good life, and that he's always praying for me, and that he just wants to meet me someday, but it was just really encouraging to see that, because they wanted me to have a good life. Wow. That's beautiful. I'll give you a hug. Thank Thanks. you so much for your vulnerability and sharing that. Thank you. Again, thank you very, very much for, for sharing that and for being so vulnerable with us. And I'm tearing up, too. Um, anyway, last question. Um, David, if you can keep your answer brief, just a couple minutes, and then we'll head to dinner. Sister? David, thank you. Yeah, it was excellent. But before I ask you my question, I just have to address this beautiful woman, a uh, young woman who just went up to tell you I am adopted myself and recently found my biological family. I'll be very happy to talk to you after if you'd like. We have something in common. Thank you for your vulnerability and your courage in getting up there. Very touched. So David, yeah, your, what courage. I had no idea you were shy. You're such an excellent speaker, actually. So thank you for, for sharing and going outside your comfort zone. Uh, my question is, I know now you're a lawyer, and you had mentioned something about adoption advocate. So I wanted to know, as a lawyer, are you helping families to, uh, with adoption? And if you're not, just what is that process, and is it difficult to, to adopt a child? I love that question because I'm very excited about the answer. My answer would have been different a year ago. Uh, now it's, it's, I love the answer because I primarily do commercial litigation, which is boring. Uh, but now I've been blessed with an opportunity to, to somewhat start an adoption practice and actually facilitated my first adoption two months ago. And it was beautiful. And to see the family all together, I took a picture with them and it was just, it, it was, it was incredible. And it was special for them too because they had struggled to find a good lawyer that would, that would handle it for them. And to know that, that I was coming from my background, you know, made it all just kind of connect. Uh, and adopting's hard and it's sad. I mean, but it's a, and it's all, I, I, I cannot speak to Canada law at all. Uh, but even within the U.S., it's all state-specific, and then it gets even more complicated when it's interstate, mm. when, you know, mine was interstate. So I was placed for adoption in Indiana and adopted to my parents in Louisiana. So then you're dealing with conflicts of law rules, and it gets very complicated, and adopting is a long process, and it's expensive. Uh, there's some adoption tax credits, but in the end, I mean, it can cost around thirty to 40000 for a private adoption. 
because a lot of it you're paying, you're paying those lawyers, right? And you're paying um, for birth mother expenses. And you're paying for all of the court filings. You're paying for the home studies, the home visits. And it's a complicated regime. And I think there needs to be some, some changes to it. But it is what it is. And I hope that we can pass more laws in Louisiana that, that make it easier to adopt. Thank you for um, the work you're doing for that. I hope that you'll bring many families uh, with children in that. And thank you for impacting my life with your documentary since I too was adopted. God bless you. Thank you. Can I get a final round of applause for David Scotton? Thank you.